The History of Western Imran, Part 1, Prehistory and Cosmology. Far more of history has been forgotten and turned to dust than ever was recorded, but we must delve into the past to comprehend the present. The Writings of Associate Angelia. The cultures of Western Imran have, a, have deeply rooted history stretching back into prehistory. The oldest histories and legends derive from tales passed by word of mouth from untold millennia before the written word. Even, even once the region's various cultures began to document history, records did not always survive intervening centuries, and so much of the ancient past remained obscured. This is doubtably true for the legends of the times before the oldest civilizations. This includes myths passed down through the generations about the creation of the world, the origin of the gods, and the cosmology within which these unfathomable entities exist and perform their functions. Over time, theologians have attempted to add to these ancient myths with understanding gained from trusted prophets or others who have claimed to have a special communion with the divinities. Despite these efforts, the gods remain elusive and enigmatic beings, only rarely communicating their will and preferring to do so through signs and portents, or cryptic dreams. No one denies the existence of divine beings, rather even those who de dedicate their lives to studying such matters confront the fact that their understanding will forever be incomplete. Creation and the Primal Gods, Menoth and the Devourer Worm Across the land of Western Imran, dominated by humanity, the most widely held belief, belief story of the origins of the world is that Menoth, the lawgiver, arose from the formless chaos that predated creation. He shaped Cain and its son as an extension of his imperative to bring lasting order. Having risen, arisen self-made, Menoth adopted a form that pleased him, one that would later echo amongst his greatest creation, mankind. In art and sculpture, Menoth is depicted as a towering masked figure, his sublime visage concealed from mortal eyes to protect them from his naked wrath. This god strode Cain in the primal days, and mankind rose from Menoth's shadow as it fell upon the still forming waters of, of the world as they withdrew from the land. Menoth imposed a, his rigid order upon, turning the, upon the turning of the seasons and the cycles of life and death. In his wake, humanity rose uh, and began to gather into tribes. Menoth was not the only powerful entity to emerge from the unformed chaos, as from the darkness came the Devourer Worm, also called the Beast of All Shapes, a bestial and forever changing monstrosity that would quickly become Menoth's greatest foe. When Menoth gave, where Menoth gave rise to humanity, a race capable of higher thought, the Devourer Worm spawned an endless variety of ravenous beasts and the horrors of the wilderness. All predators and dangerous beasts are thought to have arisen from and be connected to the worm. And since the dawn of time, they have beset the offspring of Menoth and the works of civilization. The worm was filled with an endless hunger and sought only to eat and kill, to destroy and rend what had been created. Menoth knew the worm at once for his enemy, and they would clash again and again in an unending hunt, a battle that has occupied both of these primal powers since the dawn of creation. Addendum The Worm and the Night Sky in ancient myths, it is from the night sky that the worm first emerged, and this primal god is strongly associated with certain celestial objects. This includes the eye of the worm, now thought to be a remote planet, also circling the sun, and Cain's three moons. Calder, the largest, is sometimes referred to as the Lord Moon, while Laris, the second largest, is often called the Baleful Moon. The third and smallest is Artis which is described as a timid and shy maiden, forever running from the beast of all shapes. 
Each of these moons has had other associations, some of them more romantic, but though but through much of human history they have been seen as ominous figures connected to omens of natural disaster and ruin, particularly during key conjunctions. Followers of the worm have long revered the moon and conduct ritual feasts at times tied to Calder's cycle in particular, celebrating when it is both full and empty. And addendum. The first brutal and titanic clashes between Menoff and the worm first took place on the surface of Caen, shattering the land and tearing great trenches into the deep oceans. Where one was thrown by the other, great chasms opened to divert the course of rivers, while the earth puckered with wounds that become volcanic eruptions of lava. The hammered and the broken land gave rise to jagged mountains and deep valleys. Eventually, this chase led Menoff and the worm away from the physical world to Yurkan, a spiritual mirror to Kan. This would be the afterlife realm where all souls of those born and eventually slain on Cain would travel. In your Cain, the power of the gods was magnified, as this place proved to be the wellspring of the formless energy the divinities draw upon to shape reality. Your Cain is a region between the world and the formless chaos from which Menoff and the worm arose, giving a semblance of form by proximity to and in reflection of the material world. Like Cain, Yurkan would be shaped by the clashes between Menoff and the Worm, and this battle continues there still, with no signs of ever ending. Thus occupied by these battles, Menoff had no time to shelter or even guide humanity, and the scattered tribes were left to their own devices in the wild places. Some say mankind was cruelly neglected for a long era left to live short and brutal lives while trying to survive countless horrors. Menites believe this time was a necessary crucible that strengthened mankind and allowed its tribes to find inner strength. Addendum Pervasive Evidence of Menoff Contact between the inhabitants of Western Emerin and up with other far-flung cultures has strengthened the belief that Menoff is indeed a primal god and creator of man, even amongst the scientific-minded. The first contact with foreign humans occurred with the arrival of hostile invaders called the Orgoth, who landed on Imerisian shores, having originated from a previously unknown continent to the west of Imerin. Recent, more recently, Imerisian ships have made contact with different cultures, thriving to, on the closer and more accessible southern continent of Zu. In both cases, anecdotal evidence suggests that vast differences, vastly different human societies describe their creator as a towering masked figure, even, even if referring to him by a different name. Even the Orgoth are thought to have abandoned worship of the Creator in favor of more insidious powers. End addendum. Much of humanity forgot their Creator, and many turned to the worship of the Worm. All great predatory beasts and animals are seen as incarnations of the Worm's primal hunger, and the tribes serving the Worm glorified these intermediaries. They worshiped the wolf, the bear, the eagle, the serpent, and carved totems in their gathering places and gave them offerings. Some even went so far as to profane the Creator's work by feasting upon the flesh of their own kind. Duina Trollkin, Orgron, and Gobbers have their own creation myths passed down through the generations. These races do not dispute that Menoff once walked Can, gave rise to humanity, and is involved in an internal clash with the Devourer Worm. However, Duina in Duinians res insist their goddess was the first and most primal of the gods and is not simply the creator of the Duinian races but mother to all life. In these legends, Duina and Cain are synonymous with the world described as the physical body of the goddess. The feminine forms carved in stone to represent Duina are abstractions of her aspect as goddess of fertility and do not represent her actual being. 
Duena is inextricably bound in the cycles of the seasons, which represent the natural processes of life and of, and of, of rebirth. These faiths believe that the primal days Duena and the worm were the own. Uh, sorry, these faiths believe in the primal days Duena and the worm were the only divine beings. To Duena cr was credited the rise of plants the nurturing rains, species that fed upon the leaf and branch, the turning of the seasons, and the cycle wherein fresh births renew life by replacing those slain by age, disease, or violence. The worm is credited with the predatory species that preyed on other creatures to survive, as well as the storms, earthquakes, floods, volcanic eruptions, and anything in nature that was abrupt and catastrophic. The Duenian races trace their origins often to the violent mingling of these two primal powers. The worm is said to be engaged in an ongoing and repeated ravaging of Duena, the proof of which exists in the aftermath of every destructive storm and flood. In the early days, the Duenian species were born of this coupling, and it is from this reason that many of these races have qualities of both of their divine mother and father, able to be savage and violent yet noble and honorable. In various times, these races have, had a close, have been closer to one or the other of their divine parents, devoting their worship to either the worm or Duena herself. The conflict between Duena and the worm is the basis for Duenian legends about the origins of Menoth, who they do not believe was self-created. In these legends, Duena wished for reprieve from the worm and so fostered a great hunter from the greatest of her children, which became Menoth, who was set upon the task of hunting the devourer. The goddess bestowed him with the power, virility, and strength to fight the worm. As he hunted across Cain, humanity rose where he passed and proved to be a race consumed with the same desire to subjugate the wilderness. Menoth eventually chased the worm off Yurkan and into the shadowy realm born of the worm's nightmarish dreams, a place humans call Yurkan. Menites consider this tale heret many many Menites consider this tale heretical, and this is exacerbated violent confrontations between these faiths. Yet whether the differences of opinion between these myths Menoth, Duena, and the Devourer Worm are widely acknowledged as the first and most primal of gods. In this long dark era, tribes of these early races employed primitive weapons, clothing, and shelter, and endured a very variety of perils from the wilds, including ravenous beasts, natural disasters, and warfare from other tribes. Neither Menite nor Duenian myths give explanation for other gods, such as the pantheons worshipped by the elves of Ilos, or the dwarves of Rule. The origins of these deities seem to be <clears throat> seem to, I'm sorry, seem to be rooted in Yurkan. Duenians insist all life on Can is connected to Duena and the worm, so the species created by other gods must be connected to these primal gods. Addendum, or Boros, the world serpent. While many, while most of humanity has long has, has long had an uncomfortable and hostile relationship with the entity called the Devourer Worm and ignored Duena, a single ancient secret society has spent time and effort to understand the natural world's cosmology. The black clads of the Circle of Boros draw nat supernatural power from the chaos imbued by the Devourer Worm. They describe the natural world in a way not entirely dissimilar from Duenian shamans, but together with a complex philosophy and systematic approach of their own. The Blackclads believe both the worm and Duena are simply manifestations of a single, primal, and all-pervasive entity they call Oboros. By the philosophy of this group, Can and therefore Duena represent the tangible physicality of Oboros, while the consensus while the conscious will and most violent impulses of Oboros are embodied in the Devourer Worm. The Circle does not worship Oboros, but are often mistaken as priests or prophets of the Devourer. The Druids make use of this misconception to manipulate Devourer worshippers by dint of their powers in esoteric mysticism. The black clads exist outside of society and are hated by Menites and mistrusted by most other religions. And addendum.
Yurkayan, Reincarnation, and the Afterlife. From even the most ancient of times, priests and shamans of the primal gods recognize that living flesh is connected more to an effable spirit. Everything that lives has spiritual essence, although the simplest plants and creatures have similarly simple spirits. Intelligent races, those capable of complex thought, language, self-awareness, and the ability to craft tools, have more potent essences, called souls. Souls are nearly indestructible and immortal, although they can suffer and change. After death, the spirit separates from the flesh and passes into another state of existence. The mysteries of the afterlife is inextricably tied to religion and the affairs of the gods. Holy men have been aware of the spiritual realm existing paradoxically both near and far removed from Cain, which they named Yurkan. It is here that most humans believe their souls travel after death. The consensus is that most of Yurkan is dangerous and foreboding, a spiritual mirror of the will of the wilderness between cities on Cain. The only hope for an afterlife beyond wandering lost aimlessly this, amid this spiritual wilderness is to spend one's life in pious devotion. After death, those who are pious are guided to the shelter domain of their god. The wilds beyond a god's domain is hell. This is an unpredictable and terrifying expanse where souls are harried off by monstrous beasts before being scooped into the maw of the worm and digested for an indeterminate era before being expelled as withered husks. Fear of death is entirely natural, and so is the desire to find religion as death nears. Whether hasty prayers at the final hour are enough to, for salvation is unknown. Priests say the only way is sure, the only sure course is a life better spent. Duenian reincarnation. Duenians do not decipher their act, do not depict their afterlife in the similarly bleak terms as humanity, believing that in a cycle of reincarnation, they do not deny your can exist, nor or that many souls travel there after death, but their souls are instead embraced by Duena. Rather than crossing over into the afterlife, their spiritual essences rejoin the mother and rise again as new life. It is from this vast collective reservoir that all life is reincarnated. The most refined and strongest spiritual essence become the souls of intelligent races, like the Trokan, the Orgon, and the Gobbers. Most Duenians expect to live multiple lifetimes, their souls strengthened by past experiences, even if they are forgotten. Not all Duenian races or the greater natural beasts reincarnate this way, as some follow the worm into your can. Certain predatory creatures, as well as worshippers of the worm, or any foolish enough to spend their lives blinded by senseless violence and gluttony, share this fate. In your can, these spirits are maddened by the ravenous howls of the worm to join the bestial god in mindless hunts on an endless cycle of turmoil. Those who worship the devourer are glad to join the worm after death, seeing these hunts as a reward rather than a punishment. Beginning of the War of Souls Amid Menoff's battle with the worm, the god became aware of the influx of souls of Yurkan from the humans he had created in the dawn of the world. Those who had fallen, who remembered the creator, joined Menoff in his battles strengthening his efforts by what, by what small degree they are able. To aggregate their souls strengthened by in, and in the aggregate, their souls strengthened his cause and were seen as worthy of protection. So too did Menoff realize that those who had forsaken him and turned to the worm would be joined to his ancient enemy. This is seen as the beginning of the War of Souls, a great cosmological conflict that continues to occupy the gods and immortal souls of all who have walked on Cain. On learning that much of humanity had forgotten their creator, Menoth became wrathful and returned his attention to Cain to reprimand the neglectful mortals. In the face of this fearsome manifestation, many human tribes abandoned their false gods and hastily sought to regain Menoth's while others fled deeper into the wilderness and refused to give up their flawed beliefs. 
Menoff promised to shelter his followers after death in a domain called the City of Man, where the worm could not reach them. Nothing but endless torment would await those who turned from him. The War of Souls would eventually be joined by other faiths, but began amid the struggle between Menoff and the worm. Creation Myths of Other Divine Pantheons The Divine Court and the Veld The elves that now reside in the reclusive kingdom of Aeos have their origins in eastern Amorin, where these people have, practically, have a particularly close relationship with their gods. Elven legends do not contradict the creation myths of Menites or Duenians, but instead stand apart. The close relationship between the elves and their creators allowed the elven civilization to quickly flourish. While elves do not predate humanity, elven civilization spread across eastern Amarin and reached great heights before humans mastered basic agriculture or masonry. The oldest legends of the elves do not speak of the world's creation, but rather the divine court of Laos, which came into being in a spiritual realm called the Veld believed by human theologians to be an isolated area of Yurkan. Amid the Veld, the palace Lo Elios was erected to house these gods and their created servants. Eight in number, these gods are associated with the cycles of the passage of time. The origin of these gods has been attributed to the mingling between the sun and other celestial bodies like the moon. The elven gods work together to ensure the security of their realm to build a lasting domain amid the wilds. They arrived at a, at a hierarchy based on their representative powers and capabilities. First among them and leader of the gods was Lysir, the Nasir of Aegis. At his, her side was the incisor of ours, Osiris, described as both her consort and co-ruler. That these gods waged war on the primal beasts beyond their domain is demonstrated by the titles taken by the gods. Osiris was the sovereign of conflict and the general of Laos. Next in the divine hierarchy was Ilysia and Nairo, she the nice, the nice Asir of the night as well as the watcher of the gates of Laos, he the Asir of day, seneschal and lore keeper. Vigilance was their charge alerting the day alerting uh, alternating day and night last of the four gods of the seasons siren nisiasir of spring and healer of the divine court lucy lurinisia isar of summer arms master of laos and chief of scouts lilis nisire of autumn court assassin and mistress of poison and nisor sire of winter and grand crafter. It was Lur Nasor who was responsible, uh, whose responsibility it was to scout out the, afield, the, the far afield from the Veld, who observed mortal souls spilling into the remote wilds. Reporting this discovery to Lysir, the Nasir of Ages followed the origins of these souls back to Cam. There she witnessed the barbary of mortal existence. Seeing the trials and tribulations undertaken by these short-lived creatures, she was amazed by how their difficulty strengthened their ineffable spiritual essence, which in turn strengthened the gods in whom they were linked. She became aware of the ecology of souls and saw how her court could benefit from the creation of a race bound to their worship. Elven legends insist that their creation was a reinforment whereby the crude and bestial shapes of other mortals were exceeded by their own forms as Lachir committed to the exhausting birth of the elvish race. Syrah was midwife to, these gen to this genesis, and so too did each god play part in linking the lives of their creations to the cycles of the seasons and the passage of night and day by the sequence of hours. The elves were birthed by Lachir's labors, would possess greater longevity, enlightenment, and other gifts that previous races lacked. Elves spent, spread quickly. The elves spread quickly across eastern Emmerin and proved their superiority to the other creatures that sought to thrive there. When Luxir, when Luxir 
was assigned his her was assured her creation was of quality she sought she made herself known to them and proved provided the wisdom of the divine court offering arcane secrets necessary so they could surpass all rivals addendum elven reincarnation and afterlife even as Lakir sought to improve upon the mortal she discovered crawling on the face of Cain, so too did she implement a different cycle of the souls of her race to experience after death. Elves believe their fate in, after, in the afterlife to have been a complex arrangement involving reincarnation followed by a final rest in Laos. In every elf soul that came to the gates of Laos in the Veld would be confronted by Alisa, the Nicaea of Night, who would weigh their worth. Souls not yet worthy, not yet ready to dwell among the gods were sent back to Cain and reborn. Others deemed sufficiently rich with experiences would pass through the gates and enter the palace city of the gods, there to spend eternity experiencing spiritual refinement. When an elven child is born, he or she may give rise to a new soul by the miracle of life, and alter or alternatively receive a reincarnated soul sent by Ayaslisa. Some claim to be able to perceive these older souls looking into the eyes of a child and seeing the weight of the past. Such old souls are thought to be particularly wise, intelligent, and charismatic. These children would not have been born since these children have not been born since the riveting. Inst instead, some elves have been born without souls perhaps empty receptacles for old souls that have been lost. Krag Drogon and the Great Fathers The dwarves of Rule have their own creation myth. The dwarves believe their flesh to be descended directly from their gods, who are their actual and literal progenitors, the Great Fathers. They came into a being they came into being in a place called Krag Drogon which literally translates as the land beneath. Human theologians consider this simply another way to describe your can, similar to the Vel. The origins of the Great Fathers rest with a living mountain and god named Gore, the greatest and tallest mountain of Crag Drogon, which towered higher than any peak on Cain. This god mountain was of such tremendous power and deep-rooted malevolence by his size and scope, he was impervious to everything that walked, flew, or swam. Yet Gore was alone and sought distraction from those who could, and sought distraction from those who could marvel at and appreciate his majesty. He searched within his bulk and drew forth thirteen of the finest crystals of his essence and carved them into shapes that pleased him, intended as useful slaves. Gore bound them in shackles and taught them stone-born taught these stone-born creatures that they must obey or be swallowed up and ground into shapelessness again. The thirteen slaves created by Gore would be created with clever hands, sharp eyes, and knew all that could be known of shaping stone and metal. Gore desired that they should build a great monument to his immortal glory. What Gore did not realize was that they were not mindless slaves, but each had within him a spark of divinity. Almost all at once, the thirteen began to dream of freedom. The names of the thirteen slaves become the Great Fathers. Durg, Dol, Dover, Gurd, Godor, Hudor, Jador, Lohurd, Odom, Orm, Sigmor, Udo, and Uldar. Each would in time prove mastery over a certain task and establish his own destiny. In the early days they were defined only by the oppression of gore and the shackles that bound them. When tasked to construct the great monument, the thirteen discovered a true love for working stone and metal and a perfectionism that would allow nothing less than their best work, despite the hatred they bore for their master. They toiled for years, crafting the most glorious tribute they could imagine to immortalize the mountain god. But when they presented it to Gore, the cruel mountain mocked their achievement and unleashed a heaving earthquake to crack the earth and swallow their work. Gore demanded that they commence again and do better. Knowing Gore's complaints were baseless, the Thirteen cleared the foundations and began anew, toiling this time in decades to create a work which would be unquestionably superior. 
By the end of their labors, they had come to love their new creation. Even this was not good enough for the tyrant Gore, who pulverized their work to sand and dust and demanded they build again. The thirteen despaired. More than an enslavement, they could not bear to watch their work be destroyed again. It was Orm, who would one day become the patron of, ma of masonry and building, who called his brothers together and devised the plan to destroy Gore and thereby set themselves free. They would appeal to the mountain god's vanity and find a way to build something that he could not bear to destroy. Gore, who would become pa Godor, who becomes patron of orators, was enlisted to propose Gore a tower so high that it would touch the sky of the land beneath. The only difficulty being such an engineering feat would require materials extracted from Gore's own body. Gore was enthralled with the idea and, cons and consented to contribute to the work. Dole, who became the patron of mining, led the efforts of the Thirteen, proving his talent to pick and shovel and his dick uh, with the pick and the shovel and his deep knowledge of stone. Giord, who became the patron of wealth, showed an affinity for following veins of precious ore and discovering pockets of crystal. The Thirteen set about the task with their pride and ingenuity, performing feats of engineering and far advance of anything witnessed before. Meanwhile, the Thirteen mined a labyrinth of caves within Gore, extracting the best stone and richest of veins of metal. Lodhur, Lodhul, who would become the patron of feasts, distracted Gore by hosting great gatherings of supplicants, while his brothers weakened the mountain god from within, preparing the mountain for collapse. As Gore became hollow and weaker, the tower grew taller. Countless seasons passed as the Thirteen committed to this task, and the tower became the promised marvel, climbing to scrape the sky. The mountain god was transfixed and basked in adoration of, of the adoration of the petitioners, who came to lavish praise on the construction, which he accepted as his due. Jehord and Odom, patrons of espionage and secrets, listened and learned all they could from Gore's deepest secrets, as well as the world beyond their prison. At last, the Thirteen reached the end of their work. As soon as they laid the last stone on the, on the spire, they set their plan in motion. They shattered the columns beneath the mountain, begin, begin, uh, beneath the mountain, beginning the rumblings of collapse of Gore. The thunderous din could be heard across Crag Dogor as Gore's immortal life was extinguished in an ever-widening cloud of dust and stone as the cave-riddled mountain fell inward. When the rumbling had finished, the greatest mountain of Crag Dogor, Dogun, collapsed to become the gentle, become gentle hills nearby, which stood the monument that would outlast it. This was the Tower of Gorfell, symbol of the Great Fathers and heart of the domain of the Ruic Gods. As Gore fell, great monsters of the prep of, from the periphery of from the periphery of Crag Dogon, Dogun intruded, seeking to seize the lands for themselves. The Great Father Dovor forged weapons which could be in which to confront them, while Udod forged armor to protect his brothers. After girding themselves, Duga, uh, Duhurg, Hodor, and Udo respectively took axes, blades, and hammers to wage war and secure their borders. After having fought to earn an era of peace, the great father Dole, who had been mining beneath the ruins of, of Gore, discovered an endless chasm. Making his brothers aware of this and feeling overcome by curiosity, the great fathers traveled through and emerged on Cain, the land of the living. On witnessing the proliferation of life, they were inspired to leave their own mark on the world, as well as find companionship to end their lonely, fraternal existence. Even as they had even as they'd been birthed from the stone, they sought to find equals in the earth, so gathered the rich and fertile clay among the air's rivers, where it flowed from what would become known as Lake Arms Deep, among the, gra among the glass peaks, and from this loom they shaped the clay wives. They would become the matriarchs of the Ruic people, as from, as from the great fathers and the clay wives were sired the first dwarves in the ancient legendary days of the world's beginning. 
For a time, the Great Fathers and the Clay Wives lived among the first Dwarven clans, which took their names of their divine progenitors. The Great Fathers passed down the knowledge and lore they had acquired during their enslavement and after. More importantly, the Great Fathers delivered the edicts by which these lives should be governed. These included the following core aspects of Dwarven culture. The Edict of Authority, which outlines the family hierarchy around the clan. The Edict of Building, establishing the importance of crafting and construction. The Edict of Duels, describing the right to resolve disputes through physical confrontation. The Edict of Feuds, with laws for larger conflicts between entire clans. The Edict of Oaths, which define the importance of sworn promises. The Edict of Ownership, giving each dwarf the right to own that which he has created, traded for, been given freely, or won in lawful duel or feud. And the Edict of Unity, binding the dwarves into unite against external threats. From these first fundamental edicts grew the Codex, which would become the written record and body of law for the Ruic people, and the only unbroken record that has persisted from the ancient times to the modern day. The Codex and its edicts would not only become the foundation of Ruic society, but would also be the holy text by which the wisdom of the Great Fathers preserved. The, the Great Fathers knew that they must return to Crag Dorgun, which had they had left unsupervised. The Clay Wives left with them, and the, so the progenitors of the Dwarves descended into the caverns beneath the earth to return to the land beneath, never again stepping foot on Cain. Their legacy was assured by the thriving and prosperous Dwarven, cl dwarven clans, beginning with the thirteen most directly associated with each of the Great Fathers, as well as a proliferation of lesser clans that broke away from these first families to establish great dynasties of them there, among the Glass Peaks. The Great Fathers are remembered by the people they had sired, in service and in prayers. Every soul was promised a place in, the, in Crag Dogun upon death, where they would join the Great Fathers in the Tower of Gorfeld, eternally refine themselves and their avocations. Tribal Era With the exception of Rule, all the peoples of Imarin, west and east, include their legends of a period of tribal existence before the onset of true civilization. This period includes many myths and legends depicting direct interaction with the gods. It is believed that this tribal period of elves was quite different from the, the that experienced by either humans or do, or trollkins. Elves organized into small city-states that periodically warred upon one another but possessed many advantages and an advanced understanding of mathematics, philosophy, and the arcane. The elves also had a small tribal period before the intervention leading to the rise of their own great civilization. Theirs was the first great civilization built on Imarin, and the first to fall. Ruic priests of the Great Fathers insist their massive codex, itself a vast library, including both ancient tomes as well as modern legal decisions, includes written records tracing back to the origins of the first clans and the first word of the Great Fathers. No outsider has been given access to the most ancient sacred text to the confirm this boast. The information contained in these tomes is, is narrowly focused on the events within the glass peaks and is often limited to the more far-flung neighboring cultures sharing the continent. The Gifts of Menoth Menites believe humanity may have continued to end barbarity indefinitely if not for the gifts of Menoth. How long humanity existed in perpetual turmoil before Menoth put aside his battle with the worm is unknowable, but it is believed that many thousands of years, when Men while Menoth's wrath had been, forgot had been forgotten was fierce, his rage diminished on witnessing the harsh indignities of life among the human tribes. Those who begged his forgiveness he treated with mercy and benevolence. He consented to bestow upon them gifts forming the foundations of Menite civilization, the flame 
the wall, the chef, and the law. The flame embodies many principles of the Menite faith, including faith and the, legacy, and the legacy of the temple to preserve and teach religious doctrine, but it also represents the use of fire to drive back the darkness, as well as forge weapons and survive harsh winters. The wall represented knowledge of masonry and engineering, whereby the first permanent townships and fortifications were erected as shelters, and also to divide settled lands from the wilderness. The sheaf is knowledge of agriculture, whereby settled tribes began to till the earth, sow seeds, irrigate, and harvest grain to support larger populations. It also represents the use of herds of cattle, which would in time grow to give rise to horses that would use as steeds and oxen to pull heavy loads, allowing Menites civilization to prosper against rivals. Addendum The Giants of Behemoth there is evidence of another civilization of the eastern of eastern Imran, one often overlooked due to the obscurity due to its obscurity. The elves of Laos have contact have contacted with a reclusive race of giants that occupied several settlements in the northeastern Imran, adjacent to and within the Sun Eater Mountains. The giants stand over twenty feet tall and are said to possess both tremendous strength as well as extreme longevity and other supernatural traits. Even at the height of their culture in ancient times, they were never numerous, and now fewer than a hundred live in the last mountain's city, Bemoth. Over the centuries, some of these, few of these giants have ventured west, and their passage inspired a number of legends. The most well-known of that is Colassa, a giant who came to, human, to the human city of Corvus during the Orgoth occupation, converted to the faith of Menite, and is credited with many heroic acts. And addendum. The law is deemed the greatest of Menoth's gifts, representing the compact between Menoth's and human humanity, as well as the agreement by which ma mankind settled into the caste and combined settled tribes to create the first true cities. Legends that predate writing do not define specific laws em employed by the earliest and now forgotten civilizations. The earliest compact between Menoth and mankind defined how righteous rulers were to be legitimized and sanctified by the priest caste. To the priests fell the responsibility of conducting burial rites to, spe to speed souls of the dead to Menoth's side in Yurkan, there to join the Creator in his war of souls.